Uh, let us pray. Father, we are grateful to you for bringing us together as your children to learn at your feet, to be edified, to be built up for the work of the ministry. We ask, Father, that in graciousness, you will pour your word upon us. You will glorify Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Therefore, let your name alone be glorified. Let your word be very simple. Let it be very clear. Let it go forth without the flesh. Let it expressly express your mind unto us. Let it affect our lives for your glory. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. You remember we concluded um, the last time, James chapter 1. And I remember that when we read that verse 27, we, we were discussing the two-edged sword of the Christian life. And we said that on one hand is personal consecration, where you keep yourself by the grace of God and walk righteously before the Lord. On the other hand is love. People will not know you by your righteousness. They will know you by your love. <laughs> Jesus said, love ye one another. He said, by this. He didn't say by holiness. He didn't say by righteousness. He says, by love shall men know that you are my disciples. But there is the other aspect. He says, to keep himself unspotted from this world. That's personal. People are not going to appreciate it. Do you know nobody appreciates holiness? People don't appreciate righteous living. Okay? But they appreciate love. So our righteous living is our personal dealings with the Lord. And our love towards others is the expression of that life to other people. And they are able to appreciate that. So you can't say I'm holy, but you are callous. You are wicked. You are known for wickedness. You are not known for love. What kind of holiness is that? You can't say I'm righteous. I have the righteousness of Christ. You have the righteousness of Christ, but we can't see the love of Christ. So what kind of love is that? That was the conclusion we reached last time. So today we are pressing further by looking at the book of James chapter 2. And um, let me just read as and speak as we go on. He says, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. What exactly does this mean? Let me read it in New Living. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Can you see that? You can't be in Christ and practice favoritism. But in order for us to understand the context in which he was speaking, verse 2 then comes in. For if they are come unto your assembly, note, note, assembly, assembly, that is the right, right and correct usage of church meeting. What we are having now is an assembly. The place where we have assembled is on a platform that is called Facebook or YouTube. We could have assembled in a building. We could have assembled anywhere. We don't go to church. We go to assemble with one another. That's the right usage. It's always good to use the right words. He said, when somebody comes onto your assembly, that means that he's not talking about a building. Their focus was never building. God knew 3,000 people would be saved. He didn't make any provision for church building. Are we saying building is wrong? No. We are simply saying that building is not the church. Please, this lesson must be clear to us. That you and I are the church. We must be delivered from this religious mindset that feels that we must go into a building for us to have a sense that we have had church. You are the church. 
what we do is to assemble. Now, do you know what the Bible say? Forsake not the assembly with one another. That's all that matters. Forsake not the assembly. It's not that he didn't say um, going to church. You can assemble with believers anywhere. As long as two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, it doesn't have to be a big bureaucratic church system. What is most important is that there is edification in that meeting. If there is no edification, we are wasting our time. There must be edification in the meeting. It's not a building we go to. That's religion. Every religion have a building. They go into the building. The building itself is part of the religion. The Christian life is not like that. We don't have any sacred building. We only have sacred body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So what we do is assembly. In fact, once you understand this, you will be delivered from the religious mindset of going to church. You must have a mindset of assembling with one another. And it is not about a star. It is not a meeting where we go and meet a superstar. It is a meeting where we remain brethren. In fact, when you look at what he said for that, he said, For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, See thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, See thou here, or sit here, under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Let me read this in NIV for you. He said, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over here or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgment are guided by evil motives? Did you see that in the body of Christ, partiality and discrimination is forbidden? We must never treat people based on how much money they have. Now, so he's saying that somebody comes to the meeting, the way this person dress, and you know, the world system say the way you dress is the way you are dressed. It is not so in the kingdom. In the kingdom, we do not address people the way they dress. We address people the way we are. <laughs> he's get the difference. In the world system, people are addressed the way they dress. In the kingdom, we address people the way we are. It is who you are that will determine how you address people, not how people are dressed. So whether somebody is wearing dirty clothes or somebody is dressed in gold in apparel, the two can, can equally sit on the same chair. You don't have to favor one just because that person is rich or has signs of affluence. Are you God? On what basis are you discriminating against the person that is poor? In the world, they discriminate against the poor. Then the poor will now come to the church and we will still discriminate against the poor. Do we want to kill the poor? Now, in modern times, it could be cars. You could discriminate people based on cars. Some people come with cars, some people come with their leg. And then you give attention to the person that comes with car, not to the person that comes by leg or somebody transferred to church account millions and another person just transferred a few dollars let's say assume 20 dollars and then somebody has paid um let's say hundred thousand dollars into church account and somebody has paid fifty dollars and then as a pastor you are informed that this is the money that came in 
will you will you ask for the number of the person that gave hundred thousand dollars and say give me the number of this brother and then you will receive the number and dial it <clears throat> hello hello servant of god you see you are the servant of god you are calling the man that gave hundred thousand servant of god hello servant of god the lord bless you the lord lift you high you will not die you know that's a cause <laughs> Because he will still die. You know, that's the problem. When you are in the flesh, you'll be playing, you'll be praying prayer that you ought not to pray. Everything you put your hands on shall prosper. What of if this man is a thief? <laughs> but the man that gave $50, those ones, they are not an issue. Do you know the scripture forbid such in the church? Now, here is it. It is now so bad that though this is in our scripture boldly boldly without any fear a man or woman will stand on the pulpit and say if you if you have hundred thousand dollars to sow a seed come here i want to lift you god is asking people god is asking 50 people who can give one million each to come up so the people that don't have those kind of money they do not they do not qualify for prayer they do not qualify for blessings you make them feel as if they are nobody in the in the assembly of their father what manner of wickedness is that and you will call those people servant of god in what way are they servant of god how can somebody mount the pulpit and say God is asking that uh, uh, God is asking 70 people to give $1,000 each and you say that person is a servant of God and he will call those people out and then he will offer special prayer for them. Prayer that does not go beyond the sleeves because God is not like you. God is not going to listen to that prayer just because you prayed it and you prayed it as if there is something about it. God knows that it is covetousness that is praying. That kind of prayer will not get to the ears of God. You are just a thief on the pulpit. He said, I want to back people. I want to lift people up from poverty. God said, I should lift people. Which God? Which of the gods are you referring to? Because certainly he's not the God of heaven. The God of heaven is not asking anybody to lift some people with money. That the amount of money they can give in the in the assembly of the saint is what we determine their lifting. We do not serve that kind of a God. But we do this openly, even though this is in our scriptures. And then you ask, what part of scripture are people reading? And then some people will say, leave them. Maybe that's the way the Holy Ghost is leading them. The Holy Spirit does not lead anybody in violation of scriptures. That's not the Holy Spirit. That is money spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never and will never work like that. He says you are of evil thoughts. Can you imagine that the scripture is saying that we must not even give special seats to people because they have money. Today, not only do you give special seats, you give special prayer. The assembly of God has nothing to do with money. Whether you have money or you don't have money should not be a disadvantage or an advantage for you in the kingdom of God. Everybody must see ourselves as one. Did you note that it's so bad? You will see in an assembly, there are plastic chairs. But the general overseer and his wife, they have two big cooking shares for them. I'm like, is their bonbon more special than every other brethren's bonbon? Somebody say, give honor to whom honor is due to. I said, if that be the case, Jesus will have insisted that while he's going through wilderness, they should carry chair and follow him. Because he's Jesus now, he needs to, he, he needs honor. He needs to sit down. He needs to sit down on cooking chair. Why can't we all sit on the same chair? And then you, you, you don't understand that you are already teaching by that. Anybody following you, you are already teaching them discrimination. You are already telling them that the man of God is more important than every other person. And it's a lie. We are all brethren. 
the same blood, the same cross, the same savior, the same faith. There is nothing about the preacher that is more important than, than the brethren. We are all brethren. And you know that even the believers, they themselves, they do not expect you to be a brother to them. They expect you to be a big man of God to them. Because I see people, they will watch my video and come and ask me, are you, are you a pastor or an apostle? If I say I'm just a brother in the body of Christ, then they stop talking to me. Because they don't want, they don't want me to be a brother. They want me to tell them that I'm an apostle. <laughs> then they can then discuss their problem. <laughs> so even they themselves have been so damaged that they think that we are not equal. And we are all equal before God. I always wonder, why must the general overseer and his wife have big coaching chairs and everybody on plastic chairs? And we are all brethren. They say, give honor to whom honor is due. You think the scripture didn't understand give honor to whom honor is due? Jesus, did you know that when Jesus was teaching in Matthew chapter 5, did you know he sat down on the mountain? Are you aware that Jesus sat down on the mountain? That is our savior. That is the person that brought this salvation. That is the message. The message himself sitting on the mountain. He didn't insist that the disciples must carry a kitchen chair to meet him on the mountain. And when they were eating, do you understand the sitting arrangement? The way they sat down. They sat down in a way that when Jesus sat, John, who was sitting by his side, could put his head on Jesus. What does that tell you about the sitting arrangement? They were possibly sitting on the same platform. And they were in close proximity that John could rest on Jesus. Who dares do that with our general overseer, our bishop, our most senior apostle today? There are evil protocol protecting them. You cannot go, you cannot touch them. They have... They have armed policemen protecting them. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's not it. That, that is the way of the world. What you are doing is the way of the world. You can be so highly anointed and at the same time, you are still a brother. That's how Jesus lived. Who is as anointed as Jesus today? He said greater things he did, we will do. But who has done anything close to what Jesus has even done? And yet Jesus remained a simple brothers to his brethren. That's the king of kings. That's the creator of all things. That's the savior. He sat down and they could rest on him. And that's the example he came to set for us. He could wash their feet. Eh? Do you know this way? Poor Ordinary brethren, these were fishermen. These were not rich men. And Jesus could wash the feet of poor men. You know, we, because we read it today, there's a way it doesn't strike us. You don't know who Jesus is. So you can't understand what it means for Jesus to sit down, put his leg on or your leg on his laps and begin to wash it and dry it with a towel. You can't understand what that means. Some people will not want me, ordinary me like this. You won't want me to even wash your leg. Jesus, Jesus. Whose, lash, whose shoe lashes were not worthy to untie? Sat down, brought his disciples' feet, and he was washing it. And he said, I have done this as an example for you. Where did we then suddenly see this? superhero mentality that we have in the church where we do not consider each other as brothers and sisters that we truly are where is this discrimination where there is attention on people who have money and people who are poor you know <laughs> poor people are in trouble the society discriminates them the government discriminate them. The only hope they have, which is the church, discriminate again. Yet we are told that if we do that, verse 4, are ye not partial in yourselves? 
Are you not partial? Are you not discriminating? See, our it, it goes beyond. It, it goes to the point of ethnic and racial issue. If the general overseer is from a particular ethnic group, the only people that will be rising in that assembly are people of that ethnic group. All other ethnic groups, they will look as if they are not good enough. Why are you discriminating? Jesus, the salvation of Jesus didn't discriminate between Hausa, Ibo, or Yoruba. He, neither did he discriminate between white, Jews, Arab. No, it never did. So why are we discriminating each other on account of all of those things? Jesus has set us a good example. He lived, can you imagine Jesus? Somebody who can go to the grave of a dead man for four days and say Lazarus comfort. I'm not talking of all these people faking, doing fake things today. You know, a, a pastor's wife called me. He says, sir, I saw something that shocked me. She was afraid to even talk to me. I said, madam, what exactly happened? He said, the husband does not, my husband does not allow me to attend programs in the church apart from Sunday program. But she eventually insisted that she was going to attend. And she did the previous week. He said, what she saw shocked her. I said, what did you see? She said, every miracle was arranged. Every prophecy was planned. She says, I, I'm still in shock. I said, that's the man you married. He said, I never knew he was not born again. And yet, he's a pastor. He's a general overseer. Fake miracles, fake prophecies. Did you hear? I shared something in the course of the week. One of the tricks of false prophet, if you go and meet them, that, oh, I want to, um, I, I come for counseling, something like that. I want you to help me. I want you to pray. We said, no, 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 no. First go to the altar. Go and pour your heart to God. He will see that in his office. But that altar has been rigged with microphone. So as you get to the altar and say, Father, for this years, I don't have a child. And you are pouring your heart. He's hearing in his office. So when you come to his office, say, kneel down there, let me pray for you. Then, as he prays, Father, in the name of Jesus, mm, mm, I see you, I see you, but, you know, I see a baby hanging in the sky. It's as if you don't have a child. Ah, I say, man of God, man of God, that is true, man of God. <laughs> Not knowing that all of that is fake. These are the men, fake men like this that they come to assembly they want to discriminate but jesus who will get to the grave of a dead man for this and say lazarus comfort he can sit down on a mountain he can sit down on the same platform with his disciples he can dress like them they had access to him everybody had access to him when the disciple was guarding him against children coming to him he rebuked them he said leave them let them come to me that's jesus i don't need security just leave these ones let them come to me but then what we are doing is not right it's not right we are trusting that god will return our assembly and restore our assemblies to the point where we understand that we are brethren. We are brethren. That's the truth. Just because you are wearing suits does not in any way make you better than the next person that is poor. We are all brethren in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 5. It says, Hacking my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and ears of the kingdom, which he had promised to them that love him, but you despise the poor. You despise the poor. That's what they do today. 
In fact, today they say very derogative terms against poor people. Such that pastors will open their mouth and say, don't give money to a poor person unless you want to become poor. Do you know that is a derogatory statement? It's a derogatory statement. How could you speak like that? As if the poor in Christ are not rich in Christ. He said, don't you understand that God had chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Those people you think are poor, God has chosen them to be rich in faith. And they are, they are heirs of the kingdom. They are going to inherit the kingdom of Jesus. But you still think that they are poor. And you discriminate them on account of their bank balance. This thing we do in the church is not correct. You know, in some churches, your giving, they have a book where they keep record of your giving. It's so bad. It's so bad that they will even say, I've, I've seen videos where they refuse to bury a man because they told the student that unless they pay his tithes, all the backups of his tithes, they will not bury him. I said those ones too, it's because they are ignorant. It is not the duty of a pastor to conduct burial. It is not the duty of a pastor to conduct naming ceremony. A father should name his child. And family members should bury family members. Did Jesus not say, let the dead bury their dead. You go and preach the kingdom. Now that you that he has sent to preach the kingdom, you are now concerned with burying people. And then you say, because the man has not been donating, you will not bury him. Throw him away. He's dead. When is it about money? You are not even ashamed. You are called to preach the gospel. You are now conducting naming ceremony and burial everywhere. You that you should be ministering life. You are conducting dead burial. And you will even do it as if it is something that if they don't, if there is no money, you are not conducting. It's because those people don't know. There is nothing like burial service. We are just religious. When people die, open ground, put them and go away. There's nothing like burial service. They are dead. All the service you are doing may be useful for people who are alive. But for the person who is dead, he's gone, he's gone. He's going to stand before God and face his judgment. It is appointed unto man to die once and after death, judgment. You are discriminating. You are checking people's book are they paying are they are they in good financial standing in the church to know what you will do and what you will not do for them if a rich man is celebrating his birthday all the pastors will go they are all there <laughs> no matter how busy they will make time assistant pastor senior pastor most senior pastor junior pastor everybody they will be there if a poor man is celebrating birthday ooh, they will send the poor man their prayers. <laughs> Say, but you despise the poor. He said, do not rich men oppress you. <laughs> I love James, this brother. He says, this are the... <laughs> See, it's not, it's not against riches. So. He said, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before judgment seats. All the problem you're having. Is it not rich people that are causing you problem? Now is the, is the rich people you want to honor at the expense of poor people. Did he say you should despise the rich? No. He's simply saying you must treat the poor and the rich with the same honor, dignity, and respect. It will also be wrong to, to dishonor people because they are rich. That will also not be correct. He says, verse 7, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. If you were in the shoe of that poor man, how would you want yourself to be treated? You know, we studied some time ago what it means. Who is your neighbor? 
It is who you decide to be neighbor to. Jesus said, do unto others what you will have them do unto you. How would you want yourself to be treated? Treat people that way. He said, but if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. This is not my statement. New Testament stuff. It says that if you have, if you show partiality, let me read from New King James. It says, uh, sorry, New Living. It says, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. Did you know it is a sin? What they are doing is a sin. People who are saying, God says, God says those who have, who have 50,000 should come out. Do you know it is a sin? Some people say they want to pray premium prayer, diamond prayer, golden prayer, silver prayer, bronze. They say everybody uh, from 1,000 era below, all of you two can come. Father, we just bless this one too. Amen. <laughs> but when it gets to premium, 500,000 and above. Oh, Lord! Oh, Father! Did you know it is a sin? Those of you saying amen, you are participating in their sin. It is a sin. And they are sinning openly in, in front of us. Do you know you should send them out of your pulpit? Do you know you have authority to drive out of your pulpit people that are speaking things that are not of God? Many brethren don't know that. You have the right to drive them and say, stop, you cannot say this rubbish here. Please leave this place. And if you are the one that has done to them, you have the right to pack your Bible and leave. For if thou stand before a man and perceive he does not have the word of knowledge in his mouth, depart from his presence. That's what the scripture teaches. It is a sin. Every form of partiality, discrimination in the body of Christ is a sin. That's not my opinion. That's the word of God. Somebody sent you two people. They said, they said, sir, please pray for us. They came separately. They are all brethren. But then somebody followed up that prayer request with some money. The other person just said, sir, please remember me in your prayers. So when you want to pray, let's say it is sister B that asks for prayer with that money. <laughs> Sister A sent money. So for Sister B, say, Father, this Sister B, she asked me to remember in my prayers. Just pray, Lord, whatever may be the problem, you will look into it. Father, I pray over Sister A. You will speak in tongues more. Sister A, you will not know sorrow. Sister A, the Lord will prosper your way. Do you know that it is covetousness? Do you know that prayer is not prayer? Is wickedness. God is not like you. Do you think God is like you? Do you think God is going to hear you because you speak many words for the love of money? What kind of God do you think you are serving? How do you think God will hear a prayer because people have come out to give $1,000 each and then you are praying special prayer and you think God will hear that prayer? You must be praying to your own God, not to the King of Kings, not to the Almighty God. Not to the possessor of the heaven and earth. Not, not, not to our father in heaven. Never. Certainly not. You are not praying to the I am that I am. You are not praying to the beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. The almighty God. No. You are praying to a God in your wardrobe. If you think he's going to hear you. The Bible says it's a sin. What you are doing is a sin. And we will all sit down there. And be, you will be saying amen to their sin. Saying amen to their sin. Discrimination, partiality in the body of Christ is a sin. Don't give special shares to people because they are rich. If the richest man walk into your assembly, he should sit on the same chair that the poorest man will sit. That's not dishonor. Because on what basis will you put him on a good chair and put the other person? And say you go and stand there. 
Because in your mindset, you say, ah, this one can help the church. This one has money. Who told you that God needs men like that to help his church? Who told you God cannot finance his work? You don't know that God... <laughs> you, did you see what happened to a, 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 um, Elisha and Geazi? After working miracles, he didn't accept anything from Neman. It was Geazi who went behind to collect it. The new servant of God. He doesn't want Neman to go to, with the impression that he came to buy miracles. I tell you the truth. It's because we are doing God's work wrongly. God finances his work. He finances his work. Is it that we are running ahead of God or we are doing the work wrongly? If you are truly doing the work of God, God finances his work. A brother was telling me that where he was, he was a pastor that they were paying him 15,000 that's in Naira <clears throat> I don't know how that is in dollars maybe about 8 dollars and that's monthly and he said that money is not enough and that he had to do other jobs to meet up and he's considering to stop pastoring in that place and I told him, I said, bro, did God call you to pastor? How are you doing it for money? If you are doing it for money, please go and leave it. Quit. Go and look for full-time job and do job. Leave preaching. It's not for you. Or give God time to prepare you. We don't preach for money. You don't preach for salary. I'm not saying the money they are giving you is sufficient. I'm saying that it is irrelevant. You don't preach for money. I said, haven't you seen people that have no salary? And they are preaching and God is taking care of their needs. If you are truly called of God and you are doing the work the way he asks you to do it, at the time he asks you to do it, God will provide for you. And I noticed that God will provide for his servant first before he provides for the work. He will take care of his servants. You are not doing ministry for money. If you want to do it for money, please go and look for a job. So you will stop pastoring for the reason that money, the salary is small. Then we were never serving God. We were never serving God. So brethren, it is a sin when we discriminate he says, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. So look at his illustration. I hope you get what he's saying here. Let me read further. He said, for he, he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. You know what he's trying to say here? He's not talking about keeping the law. What he's saying here is this. That some of you may begin to see yourself that, oh, we are doing well. Um, we are not those people that sin. We, we don't do adultery, all of those immorality. No, 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 no. But you are showing partiality. You didn't consider that to be as terrible as other sin that you think are terrible. When you think of an arm robber, you think that that is a terrible sin. But you don't know that the partiality you are doing in the assembly of the saint, that it is equally sinful. So it's using the law to illustrate it that in the law, you cannot say that, okay, I'm doing so well, I'm just breaking only one law. Say you have broken all the laws. The same thing in Christianity. You cannot say I'm doing so well. But then you are going against the counsel of God in some areas. He's trying to show you that it is also not right. It's also an indication that your life is not right. He 
Then he said, in verse 12, So speak ye, and so do, as, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For ye shall have judgment without mercy. For ye shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiced against judgment. You know, if you read James, eh? <laughs> James can almost confuse you sometimes. So let me read it in very simple language for you. Verse Verse 13 said, There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. That's serious. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown. Let me read verse 12. So, whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that set you free. There will be no mercy for those who have shown, who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Did you see that he's connecting discrimination as not being merciful? And he said that, see, if you are unmerciful, you will not obtain mercy. Do you know what he's saying? He agrees with the statement of Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What is the other way around? Blessed, unblessed <laughs> are the unmerciful for what will happen. They will not obtain mercy. It's as if God puts mercy in our control. The extent to which you will have mercy. That is always scary. You know, sometimes when I look, when I just stay and look at people in public space, my heart bleeds because I see that people don't understand mercy. They don't understand that they need mercy. Oh, you don't understand it. You need mercy. But if you don't understand you need mercy, you will be unmerciful to those who need your own mercy. You see, mercy means that people don't deserve it and you have no obligation to give it. Yet, yet, you do it just for being merciful. Is that not the way God treats us? And Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Be merciful to everyone, including the poor. He said, Then you will obtain mercy. He said, God will show you mercy. If you don't show mercy, He won't show you mercy. Oh, how we need the mercy of God. You don't, you don't have an idea how you need mercy. I, see, I just wish, see, you don't need anybody to preach to you to be merciful. If you have an understanding of how much you need mercy. You need mercy. We all need mercy. And so he says we should treat one another with mercy. He says, verse 14, what does it profit my brethren? No, we won't go to that verse 14 today. I think we will just stop at verse 13. Because that verse 14 will be opening a different thought. And I think it's on a good note to close. It's on the note of mercy. God is saying to us, the way we should treat each other is on mercy. You know why? Because you also need mercy. You need mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy sometimes we just forget how we need mercy and we just treat people you just treat people you know see sometimes you, you you have the right to treat people the way you are treating them you are within your right there's no problem because mercy means that you are going against your rights to say i will show this person mercy if they say, why did you help this person? It's mercy. Why did you let this person go? I just show mercy. That means that there is nothing that warrant you letting that person go. There is nothing that warrant you helping that person. But you chose to help nonetheless. I tell you, you need that mercy more than that person. If you know what they call mercy of God. <laughs> Do you 
know God has no obligation to wake you up this morning? But he did. You know how many people didn't wake up today? Mercy. You know the number of people in the world? And you are one of the few privileged to know Jesus Christ. Do you know the implication of that? Your soul is eternally secured. Their own soul is at risk. If they die in any moment, that could be the end. But you obtain mercy. Did you know it takes mercy to know Jesus? We don't know Jesus by our power. It takes the mercy of God to bring us into the knowledge of Christ. Majority of people in the world don't know Jesus. Did you know it takes mercy for the word of God to come to our lives? Majority of people in the world don't have access to that. And we are both living in this world. There are, there are, see, the, the mercy of God, you, you can't just even fathom it. You can't, you can't just know it. There are many things that should have happened that mercy has stood in for you. Mercy, 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 mercy. So many things that could have gone wrong for you, but mercy spoke for you. But you don't know that it's mercy. So you are not showing mercy. We must treat each other with mercy. We must treat each other with love. It says when you show mercy, God will show mercy to you. Because you also, you will need mercy. If not that we are not wise, we offend in many things. And then we go to God, Lord, I'm sorry. And sometimes we do this every day. And he forgives. Why does he forgive? Mercy. But you, you say, he did it the first time. He did it the second time. This third time, I'm not tolerating it. Your mercy is only three times. The third time, your mercy is exhausted. But the same you, the same you, the same you, you cry to God, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive my sins. Tomorrow, God, I'm sorry. Forgive my sin. Do you know he will forgive you? But if somebody has tried that with you three times, on the third time, you will show that person you are not merciful. <laughs> you say, this third time, I can no more tolerate it. You will tolerate it too. We must show mercy. Mercy. Did you know that? Did you know how people have perished because, before, because they don't know the truth? Do you know how people are perishing? I had a terrible story yesterday of a young lady, well favored. She got a job. She got married. Everything was going smoothly for her. One month into her wedding, into her marriage, she was concerned that she had not conceived. One month, just one month. And she became afraid. What was her fear? Oh, if, if I don't conceive on time, somebody else can, can, can snatch my husband. And what was the thing she would do? She started attending one prayer camp. And her friend who was telling me this story said, I told her, I said, why are you going to this prayer camp? Why can't you wait on the Lord? Moreover, I just one month into your wedding. Why can't you just trust God? She was going into prayer camp. And in one of those journeys, the bus she was, she was in, the driver didn't see a trailer was staying on the road. And the, the driver went under the trailer. Everybody died, including that lady. And you know, when I heard a story, my heart was like God. If only they know the truth. Number one, Marriage is between a man and a woman. It's not between a man, a woman, and a child. That's family. Marriage is different from family. Whether there is a child or not, it should not affect couples. You know, when people don't know this truth, you don't know what it means when you say you follow Jesus. You've given up your rights to everything. If he chooses not to give you a child, so be it. Why are you anxious? Looking for a solution, looking for a solution. You know, we just think we must just seek solution. But my point is this. It is mercy 
that we know this truth. There are Christian couples who have been married for years without a child. They've been serving Jesus. They are not running here to scatter because they know the truth. But one month into somebody's ex wedding, she's already going everywhere looking for prayer meeting and died in the process. It's mercy. That's my point. It takes mercy. Don't think the truth you know, you know it because you are hard working. Don't think you know it because, because, oh, you know you, you used to listen to correct messages. It's mercy. It is mercy that has brought you into the knowledge of God. Don't take it for granted. It is mercy. On this note, we are going to pray. We are going to pray that God will deliver us from partiality, injustice in the church. God will deliver us from being unmerciful. That's what we'll focus on today. Let us pray. Just speak with God. Just speak with God. Have you been involved in this discrimination? The word of God says it is a sin. It is a sin. What should you do when you have sinned? You should repent. If you have been convicted in the course of this message, then go before the Lord and repent. You are part of a committee, but you discriminate in the execution of your work in the assembly. This is the time to say, Lord, we are sorry. He said it is a sin. There should be no class system in the body of Christ. We are all brethren. Have you been involved in class systems? Some of you are preachers. Some of you are pastors. Evangelists. Prophets. But you've classified yourself as a different class from the brethren. Today is a day to repent. We are all brethren. That is what scripture teaches. We are all brethren. You are the type that you have been paying attention to rich people. Only rich people in your assembly has your time. Get to have your time. Some of you, you have been involved in fraud, claiming that God told you that 5,000 people who can give 5,000 should come out. $5,000. You are asking for 10,000 seeds to bless people. And you make people who do not have a hundred dollars to eat to look as if they are nothing. Repent today. Ask God to show you mercy. Ask God to forgive you that you probably did it in ignorance. You did it because you love money. I'm telling you, don't gloss over this issue. The scripture makes it very clear. It says it is a sin. It is a sin. Repent of that sin today. The blood of Jesus is available to wash you. God is restoring you. God wants to bring us back to the normal Christian life. The normal assembly life of the body of Christ. We are when we come together, nobody is behaving as a superman amongst us. We are genuinely at heart, brethren. God also spoke to us today about mercy. There is a particular situation that God is asking you to show mercy, but you are insisting on your rights. God is impressing it on you that don't worry, just show mercy. Go and show mercy, but you are insisting that no, 
you are going to stand on your right and deal with this person because gen sincerely this person has offended you but god is saying go and show mercy my brothers and sisters you better repent now and show mercy hmm. for you do not know the day when the mercy of god needs to speak over your life there are a moment that will finish your life but mercy will have spoken for you this is your own day of investing in mercy i'm telling you the best investment in the world is investment in mercy hmm. he said blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy it's like saying blessed are those that give hundred dollars for they shall obtain a billion dollars because your own mercy compared to god's mercy is incomparable even the unit of money that i've used to illustrate it is is not perfect but just to give you an idea that your own mercy is like a dollar the mercy of god is like a billion dollar and god is saying show mercy so that i too can show mercy give one dollar so that i can give you one billion dollars what you are calling mercy is small compared to what God calls mercy. So you better show your own little mercy so that you can get God's big mercy. We need mercy. You don't know what is going on in your kidney. You don't know what is going on in your liver. You don't know what is going on in your lungs. You don't know if there are arteries in your heart that are about to block. You don't even know. You don't know if you are about to have hemorrhage in your brain. You don't know. You don't know what the mercy of God can do. You won't even know. Yet the mercy will have gone ahead to speak for you. You don't know that you were about to cry over a child, but mercy spoke for you. And God is not asking you to just show small mercy. He said, no, you are insisting. Uh, you are insisting. He's cheated on me. I cannot forgive him. I cannot help him. He's a terrible husband. We agree he's a terrible husband, but he says show mercy. It's mercy we are talking about. We are not talking about right. If it is to be right, you are justified. But we are saying show mercy. God is asking you to show mercy. God will be bringing people to your mind and say, that person, you have not shown mercy. You have not shown mercy. This person has been ungrateful. You say, I will not send anything to him again. I will never send her anything again. God is saying, don't worry. I know he has been ungrateful. I know she has been unthankful. But just go ahead and show mercy. Just show mercy. It's mercy. So, see, if it is right, you are on your right. You are within your right. But God is saying mercy. He says, so that you too can obtain mercy. We must begin to treat each other with mercy. Mercy. Oh, mercy. I, I pray that you will understand your need for mercy. Because when you understand your need for mercy, it becomes easy for you to be merciful. You will just know that without mercy, you are finished. Mm. I'm telling you the truth. I have been in situation that it takes only a moment, just a moment for me to be destroyed. And I saw the hand of mercy. The mercy hand came in like this. I will be stupid. I will be foolish not to show mercy. Because I know without mercy, I will not be standing here. Because mercy, you also need mercy terribly. Oh, how beautiful is the mercy of God. That he will not even count our sins against us. But he will look only to the blood of his son Jesus upon our lives. How great is the mercy of God. The Bible says his mercy endures forever. That's how mercy works. Mercy endures. We are not saying that this person is not hurting you. But mercy endures forever. God's mercy endures with you. You will do the same mistake 100 times in a day. The mercy of God will endure with you. And he's not asking you to just show mercy. Just a little mercy. Just forgive this person. 
Just treat this person with mercy. Mercy. Ask that you will not lack mercy. You won't lack mercy. You won't lack mercy. You know what David said? He said, surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. See, David knew that without goodness and mercy following him, he cannot succeed anywhere. What God does is that he sent two messengers to just follow you about goodness and mercy. Surely, goodness and mercy. And I tell you, wherever there is mercy, there is goodness. That's why I said goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There will be no day you won't need goodness and mercy of God to follow you. Ask God, ask God, ask God that let in, the, in your journey of life, may goodness and mercy accompany you in the journey of life. Goodness and mercy. Let them accompany you. I want us to pray for the body of Christ. You see, when we speak, we are not happy to speak of the things going on in the body. Actually, we speak because we are pained. We want God to revive us and restore us. Many people don't know this truth. I tell you, there are many that will repent today if they only have access to this truth. Ask that the Lord will revive his church. That we will once again become their new brothers and sisters. No hero, no general, no superstar. Just brothers and sisters. Peter can raise the dead and go and live with a tenor. <laughs> the Bible says that Peter dwell by the seaside by a tenor. You know the houses. You know the chanty houses by the seaside. That was where Peter, who just raised a dead person, went to stay with an ordinary brother. Was not asking for a five-star hotel. That God will restore the church. He will restore us. To the simplicity of life of Jesus. We will emulate Jesus. Who could sit down on a mountain? Who didn't demand a kitchen share in the wilderness? Who sat with his disciples on his, on the same platform? They could even rest their head on his chest. That's a man that walked on water. That's a man that ascended without any help. That's a man that, that we, his, his saliva opens the eyes of the blind. What we call waste product, Jesus used it to, to open the eyes of the blind. Saliva. How many people give value to saliva? But for Jesus, saliva is a tool for miracle. That same Jesus, brethren, that same king, that same savior, he sat down with his disciples. He didn't discriminate against them. He didn't show himself as the mighty one among them. Even Jesus referred to himself as the son of man. Go and check the scriptures. Jesus does not call himself the son of God. He referred to himself as the son of man. As ordinary man. Even though he know very well that indeed he is the son of God. That simplicity that God will restore it to the body of Christ. We will stop serving and worshipping men. God will deliver our puppet from covetous ministers. He will deliver our puppet from thieves. He will give us men with simplicity of the heart of Christ. Men that will set up the example of Jesus amongst us. We are our love for one another. We will be so powerful that the world will say we are indeed of Christ. Our love will become a message. Our love will become a testimony. That's what we desire. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. In the last two weeks or so, we have had very difficult times. To the point where even the internet, the platform we are using, everything just seems to be under attack. But God is gracious and merciful. Today, everything had gone very smoothly. Without an itch, 
is the faithfulness of God. Commit the programs in the week into God's hand that the Lord will meet with us. Commit yourself also that the Lord will direct your path and order your steps aright. Everywhere you go, his favor will go ahead of you. His mercy will accompany you. Begin to thank him and round up your prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for his mercy uh, to bring us again today. I want to tell you that uh, the life has done perfect. I'm not too sure I've had a perfect life like this. Yeah. Everything went perfectly well. Um, Facebook accepted all our appeals that we didn't violate any right. So I think maybe as a result of that, <laughs> there was no flagging. The internet also didn't fail. Uh, so we want to thank God. By God's grace, we are working on an alternative. At least we have an alternative to the arrangement we have currently in times of the internet. Um, hopefully to, by tomorrow, Monday, that will be perfected. Uh, so we are trusting God to just keep helping us to grow. So tomorrow our teachings will resume for the teachings of Christ series, um, 9 p.m. Nigerian time or West African time. It's the same thing. West African time, Nigerian time is the same thing. That will be 8 p.m. British time, 8 p.m. Ghana time. The flyers are already out, so please share them. We will reshare them. They are on this platform, all the platforms. We are watching on YouTube. Just check the community section. You will find the flyers there. So you can, you may want to share them, but we will reshare them so that you can continue, um, to share them. So they are all, they are all out. We trust that God will help us. So we'll be meeting Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday program has not yet commenced. Um, hopefully, Lord will guide us. We are just trying to put certain things in place. You will hear more of them as times the time goes on. Uh, so I want to thank God for every one of you who has made time again to be here. Please, as you go out of this life, if it's convenient for you, you can please share it. You may also copy it and put it on your status, either on Telegram or WhatsApp. Um, or share it on your Facebook status, whatever platform that you feel comfortable to share, please, um, share it. We have to say it out of responsibility, not to pressure you to share. If you don't share, you will be blessed. <laughs> so it's God is not waiting to bless you because you share. But if you share, uh, you will have helped. It. So it could be your own way of evangelism. All right. All right. On that note, let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.